Hi, I'm Mamie McLean. I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And today I'd like to talk with you about some of the exciting changes that we've seen in our field over the past few years regarding advanced fertility treatments. Today we'll cover some of the new indications for IVF and cover some of the changes that we've implemented to reduce the risks associated with this treatment and improve outcomes for your patients. The objectives of my talk today are to cover the process of in vitro fertilization, to review some of the indications for IVF, the usual success rates, and the risks associated with these procedures. Additionally, I'll be talking about some of the new indications for IVF, such as fertility preservation and genetic testing of embryos. Along the way, I'll touch on some of the strategies that we now use to improve ART outcomes. ART contributes now to over 1.5% of all live births in the United States every year. So for some of you, you may refer us to some of your patients for IVF, or you may deliver some children conceived by these means. So it's important for you to be familiar with what your patients are going through. Additionally, we contract with some local OBGYNs who refer us their patients who live long distances from UAB. For instance, we have some patients who travel to our center from Tennessee, Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida. And due to the time involved with this procedure and the frequency of ultrasounds, we often will ask local OBGYNs to help us with the monitoring of their patients for in vitro fertilization. They help us by performing the frequent ultrasounds that we need and the daily blood work this is, that is necessary to follow these patients. This is a typical ultrasound of an ovary that is undergoing hyperstimulation for in vitro. The black areas represent the follicles that contain eggs. Depending on the size of the follicle, we know whether or not it contains a mature oocyte. Patients give themselves daily fertility injections for eight to 11 days, and we monitor their progress with the daily ultrasounds and blood work to know when their cohort of follicles is ready for trigger stimulation. They give themselves their final fertility injection, which triggers ovulation, and they undergo a transvaginal cyst puncture 36 hours later. We have special ultrasound fitted with a needle guide that we use to puncture and aspirate the follicles seen on ultrasound. This procedure is done under conscious sedation with anesthesiologists administering propofol and Versed here at UAB. Our new IVF procedure suite has been in use about three years and is just adjacent to our clinic, so it is easy for us and our patients to use. Six to eight hours after egg retrieval, our embryologist, Dr. Edmonds, then performs fertilization by one of two common methods. The morning after the egg retrieval, we will then know the number of oocytes that have fertilized. And you can see a fertilized egg at the top left. We then co-culture these embryos for five days until they've reached the blastocyst stage. We now are performing nearly all of our embryo transfers at the day five or blastocyst stage because the embryonic genome is activated between day three and five. Thus, we are better able to select the best embryo that has the greatest reproductive potential for our patients on day five compared to day three. The embryo transfer is then performed on day five under ultrasound guidance. Our patients continue on estrogen and progesterone supplementation until about eight weeks of pregnancy. The most common risk of IVF is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And a large study published by the CDC last month showed that ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, the moderate to severe type, occurs in only 153 women out of every 10,000 cycles. Most of these can be managed as outpatients with admissions occurring only 35 times out of every 10,000 cycles. Additionally, multiple gestations are extremely common from IVF. And while we've been able to reduce the incidence of triplets and higher order multiple births over the past years, the twin rate remains stable. You'll see multiple gestations occur in about 45% of all ART births. Also, many patients wonder what the risk to their offspring will be should they embark on this type of fertility treatment. And the good news is that the largest studies we have to date show that the risk of anomalies is only slightly increased over that of the general population risk with an odds ratio of 1.37. 
The investigators who performed this study included all different types of anomalies, things from polydactyly and cleft palates up to the most severe significant types of anomalies. Additionally, they didn't compare these patients who needed IVF obviously with underlying infertility, to other infertile patients. They compared them to the general population. So the diagnosis of infertility in couples needing IVF obviously presents a confounding factor in these results. However, we can reassure our patients that the risk is only slightly increased and it includes some anomalies that many would consider to be insignificant. There is additionally an increased risk of imprinting disorders such as Angelman's syndrome, and even singleton gestations conceived from IVF do have an increased risk of preterm birth and low birth weight. The other risks of IVF fortunately are very rare, things like infection, visceral injury, and ovarian torsion. Success rates from IVF have been increasing over the past years due to improvements in laboratory technologies. You'll see that the percentage of transfers resulting in live births on the top row can be as high as 47% in women under the age of 35. This chart is from data published from the SART database. I encourage you to go onto their database and look at each individual IVF center's pregnancy rates before you refer your patient somewhere. Again, as we discussed earlier, one of the major risks from IVF is the risk of twins. And you'll see that risk in the second to the last row with nearly 30% of women under the age of 35 conceiving twin gestations from IVF. Over the recent years, many in my field have advocated elective single embryo transfer as a way to reduce the risk of twins. And most of us in our field are moving this way. You can see that 14.8% of women under the age of 35 received an elective single embryo transfer in 2012. This number is increasing and hopefully will help reduce some of the risk of multiple gestation from IVF. Additionally, with the completion of our new IVF suite here at the Women and Infant Center, we've seen record results from live birth rates from our IVF program. Additionally, we have only had two triplet pregnancies conceived from IVF over the last three years. Both of these were pregnancies conceived from a double embryo transfer where one of the embryos split into two. So we are committed to helping our patients achieve pregnancy and the safest pregnancy for them and their baby. At the top of this slide, you'll see some of the traditional indications for IVF. Tubal disease, severe male factor, unexplained infertility, and failed prior fertility treatments. However, the most recent SART data from 2012 shows some of the diagnoses listed in patients undergoing IVF. You'll see that male factor and diminished ovarian reserve both contribute 17% to the diagnoses listed in the SART database. However, you'll see that other is now listed nearly 8% of the time. It is likely that some of these patients who listed other as their indication for IVF included those who presented for fertility preservation. Ever since the American Society for Clinical Oncology recommended that all patients facing cancer treatments be informed about the risk of infertility from their planned treatment and discuss their options for fertility preservation with their physician. We have seen an increase in the number of referrals for oncofertility. Additionally, we'll see patients who are facing gonadotoxic treatments for rheumatologic conditions, as well as women who are BRCA carriers, whose physicians have recommended early prophylactic oophorectomy. Also, there are case reports of patients with Turner syndrome who as teenagers know that they are facing impending premature ovarian insufficiency. In 2013, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine declared that oocyte cryopreservation was no longer experimental. And since then, we've seen an increase in the number of women referred to our center for elective oocyte cryopreservation for either personal or professional reasons. Techniques for cryopreservation have improved significantly over the last few years. The first live birth from an embryo that had been cryopreserved was in 1984. However, now with these advances in technology, our success rates from a frozen embryo transfer nearly approximate that from a fresh transfer. In fact, many in our field feel that outcomes from a frozen embryo transfer may actually be better than that from a fresh cycle. And that's because of the super physiologic hormone levels seen in fresh embryo transfer cycles. In 2013, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine declared that oocyte cryopreservation was no longer considered experimental. 
While the first live birth from an oocyte that had been cryopreserved was in 1986, the time since then belittles the challenges and difficulties that embryologists have had with oocyte cryopreservation. The oocyte is larger than the embryo and contains greater water content. Additionally, oocytes are frozen in the M2 phase. This is when they have completed meiosis I and the chromosomes are arrested in metaphase of meiosis II. You'll remember from medical school that they are arranged along the metaphase plate on the meiotic spindle and intracellular ice formation can damage this very delicate arrangement of chromosomes, leading to poor survival from frozen oocytes. Now with vitrification techniques for both oocyte and embryos, we have improved survival for both and greater pregnancy rates from oocyte cryopreservation because of vitrification. Data now suggests that survival of mature oocytes from cryopreservation can be as high as 90 to 97%. This is likely specific to each reproductive endocrinology and infertility clinic. Fertilization and implantation rates approximate those from fresh oocytes. And you'll see that the clinical pregnancy rates per transfer have a pretty significant range. However, in some clinics, their success rates from frozen oocyte cycles are approximate to those from their fresh cycles. Patients will often ask us, how long can my eggs remain frozen? The data that we have suggests that there's no difference in survival, fertilization, or implantation rates in oocytes that have been frozen up to 48 months. Additionally, a series that looked at up to 900 live births conceived from frozen oocytes showed that there was no difference or, or even no increased risk in congenital anomalies in these offspring. We encourage women healthcare providers to understand these techniques and to be advocates for their patients. Nearly 76% of childless cancer survivors want children in the future, and nearly a third of breast cancer patients report that their infertility concerns influence their treatment decisions. Also, those who felt that their fertility was addressed do tend to cope better with chemotherapy. Many patients and providers understandably have concerns about oncofertility prior to starting chemotherapy. The great news is that the mean delay to time to start chemotherapy is only 11 days. And studies have suggested that patients who undergo oncofertility or fertility preservation with embryo or oocyte cryopreservation do not have worse outcomes from their cohort did, that did not undergo this treatment. There's no change in mortality or even in cancer relapse, even for those with hormonally sensitive malignancies such as breast cancer. Also, many providers think that because their patient's last menstrual period was more than two weeks ago, that she would not be able to start controlled ovarian hyperstimulation in a timely fashion. And we now know that both early follicular and luteal fertility injection start times do equally well in terms of outcomes of number of oocytes frozen. So where she is in her menstrual cycle is simply not important for us in terms of fertility preservation. Also, many patients ask, how much will it cost? Will this be too expensive for us as they face mounting hospital bills from their impending treatments? And the good news is that the Lance Armstrong Foundation and Fertile Hope have offered to help patients pay for this process. And so please do not let price or cost be a deterrent for your patients facing cancer treatments. Our group is committed to helping these patients and because time is of the essence for them as they face chemotherapy, if you call us to see them, we will work them in and see them that day. So please call us, let us know how we can help. One of my partners helped this little one's parents over five years ago. Her mother suffered from cervical cancer and underwent radical hysterectomy with oophorapexy at the time of her surgery. My partner then put her through controlled ovarian hyperstimulation and retrieved oocytes through the abdominal wall. Because she no longer had a uterus, her sister agreed to be her gestational carrier. And so her sister carried to term this beautiful little girl. This story goes to show how rewarding caring for these patients can be. One of the other newer indications for IVF includes the genetic testing of embryos. This has been performed for years for couples with single gene disorders, such as cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease. But now with improved technologies, we're offering this to patients who have recurrent pregnancy loss or those with advanced maternal age. When we test for single gene disorders, this is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. 
but for those with recurrent pregnancy loss or advanced maternal age, or those who simply desire the best embryo selection possible, we offer them pre-implantation genetic screening. Less than five years ago, we used a technique called FISH analysis, which screened the 9 to 11 most common chromosomes at fault for aneuploidy and early pregnancy loss. Now we use a more comprehensive, extensive screening process using single nucleotide polymorphism testing, which literally tests for thousands of loci along each chromosome. When the embryo cohort reaches the blastocyst stage, our embryologist, Dr. Edmonds, takes one or two biopsies from the trophectoderm or the area of the growing embryo that will become the placenta. These cells are then sent off to one of the national laboratories that performs this screening while the remainder of the embryos are frozen. When we get the results 10 days later, the patient is then able to best select the embryo that has the greatest reproductive potential. They then undergo a frozen embryo transfer cycle with their next period. As I mentioned, some of the newer technologies such as array CGH or single nucleotide polymorphisms allow us to have more and better information about the chromosomes of the embryo. The majority of embryos are aneuploid and the rate can vary between 40% and 80% depending on the patient's age. This indicates how helpful the chromosome analysis can be when selecting the best embryo with the greatest reproductive potential for our patients. Some are using PGS as an adjunct to elective single embryo transfer in an effort to keep pregnancy rates equivalent while reducing the twin rate. Fortunately, the error rate from PGS has been found to be extremely low, and the largest studies show just an error rate of 0.21% per embryo. This graph shows the risk of aneuploid by patient age. You'll see the steep incline in the mid to late 30s and early 40s. This graph supports the idea that PGS can be used to improve IVF outcomes in all patients, but specifically those at increased risk for aneuploidy in addition to age. Pre-implantation genetic screening may be helpful in your couples who suffer from unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss, with the idea that most of their early losses are likely due to aneuploidy. This meta-analysis shows a comparison between live birth rate and miscarriage rate from those patients who underwent IVF with pre-implantation genetic screening compared to those who were expectantly managed and conceived naturally. You'll see that the miscarriage rate between the groups is significantly different, with those with genetically tested embryos who underwent IVF having a much lower miscarriage rate than those who conceived naturally. However, the live birth rate between the two groups is not much different. I think the most striking outcome from this study is the time to live birth. You'll see in this chart at the top, the first three lines are studies that looked at couples who underwent IVF with pre-implantation genetic screening, and the last three rows studied those who underwent natural conception. And you'll see that while the successful pregnancy rates aren't significantly different, the time to success is so. With those couples who had natural conception taking up to six years to have a successful live birth, and those who conceived with pre-implantation genetic screening, after only one to two menstrual cycles. For your couples where the female partner is of advanced maternal age, pre-implantation genetic screening may also be of benefit to them. And this retrospective cohort study showed both improved implantation and pregnancy rates with reduced miscarriage and improved live birth rates to those women between the ages of 40 and 43 who underwent IVF with PGS compared to those who just underwent IVF alone. In conclusion, IVF is a relatively safe procedure and can help many of your patients. Advances in technology have led to improved outcomes in oocyte cryopreservation, reduced higher order multiples, and then along with the more comprehensive genetic screening, we're now able to better help those with advanced maternal age and recurrent pregnancy loss. You should consider fertility preservation in your patients facing gonadotoxic treatments or even in your women whose personal or professional lives have led them to delay childbearing. This is a picture of my team at the UAB REI division. I'm extremely proud to work with these individuals um, and we would love to help you and your patients in any way we can.